Hello and welcome to today's episode of Uncovering Authenticity. I am Monique Bradley and I am in the studio right now with Mike Malloy, who is a lawyer, so I call him Mike Malloy. How are you going, Mike? Yeah, good, thanks, Monique. Good. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to the studio. I know, that, I know this is new and weird and different for you. My podcast is all about real people, real stories. Becoming a lawyer, I think, is a little bit like getting bitten by the acting virus and the fact <laughs> that it's a bit of a calling. Mm-hmm. How did you? How did this happen for you? Geez. Um, so I guess it happened because I was a ski bum and I didn't have anything. <laughs> I didn't have anything um, in my in my future which would give me the freedom to do all the things that I wanted to do. Mm. And I didn't have any ideas about um, how I could get to where I wanted to be, except for um, my dad, who's a lawyer. Mm. And that seemed like an obvious pathway. So at that point in my life, I'd, you know, I'd been to university and I'd, I'd left and I'd gone off and traveled and that sort of thing. And, um, and I, yeah, I guess that I wanted to make that change and the obvious move was to, you know, do what he has done because it was easy to see the pathway. Um, and so, yeah, so then I went off to law school and my idea at that time was I wanted to, um, you know, make uh, these sorts of changes in the world. Like um, we were speaking about it earlier, this sort of slightly altruistic kind of thing, which maybe wasn't very genuine or maybe was a little bit idealistic and, and, part of the whole university thing where you're like, oh, okay, we're reading these cases about, you know, these, these big problems that people seem to have resolved. Um, and so anyway, I was, I was kind of heading in that direction. And then when I actually got through the university machine and started working, um, it kind of changed for me. And, and yeah, I guess I ended up where I am now because the reality of practicing is quite different from, you know, my preconception of what it would be like. So you see where I, you've ended up working where you are now. What is that? Um, basically I'm a transactional lawyer, so I do, um, commercial law. So I help people out with transactions essentially. So, um, I'm not the kind of lawyer who goes to court, um, or I'm not the kind of lawyer that, you know, sits in government or, um, um, anything like that, I, I give people advice on what the law is and I help them create their own law uh, in the form of contracts. Whoa, I've never heard it described as that before, create their own law, obviously following all the legal pathways you have to follow, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I'm just talking about, um, you know, when when people agree to be bound by terms, essentially they're, mm-hmm. they're saying, look, we're going to have this arrangement between each other um, which is our own little piece of private law. And um, if we don't follow what this law is saying, then there's going to be, you know, repercussions. Mm. Yeah. So my my podcast is is about letting people or providing a space, not letting people because we can let ourselves do anything, but providing a space for people to be present with their truth. Mm-hmm. You're doing this job and you've been doing it for a while, and you'll probably continue to do it for a while longer. Why do you do that specific part of law? Why does it interest you? Um, yeah. Uh, I guess, I guess, I mean, there's lots of parts to it. Um, so, you know, it's difficult to put my finger on like a, a, a specific or, or, or a reason which covers all areas of it. But, you know, if you broke it down into small parts, like for example, um, drafting contracts, like drafting contracts is, um, sort of like an intellectual challenge. Um, Mm. and that's kind of a very sort of isolated inward looking thing that you can go and do and you can challenge yourself Mm. personally. And that's, you know, for me, I think I like, intellectual stimulation so it's, mm. it's like a good mm. you know so it's an easy space for me to be in and 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 feel happy so it fuels you yeah that, that, that would fuel me um so that's like one one 
facet of the job, which is great for me. But then there's also like this side of it, which is helping people out, dealing with people's problems, um, having people rely on you mm. and and to trust you like we were talking about mm. earlier. So, the, you know, the, those things are, give me a massive kick and, um, you know, you can get that in other areas of law. Um, but the cool thing about being a transactional guy is that, um, you know, you have these like longstanding relationships with clients where they keep coming back to you. You keep building up the rapport and building up the rapport. And, you know, ideally you end up in this position where you're sort of just going to work to work on interesting stuff and you're talking to your mates. And then at the end of it, you send your mate a bill and he pays you. Yeah. Wow. Living the dream, <laughs> so, really. <laughs> so that's pretty good, I guess. Yeah. Um, maybe that's sugarcoating it a little bit, but... Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I think for me, that's the, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I'm doing transactional law. Yeah. So from my, from my work in, in what I do, obviously, and I've talked to you about this before, a lot of the work that I do is understanding personas, personalities, the science of the brain, how the brain governs, how we show up effectively. And I understand that in the brain, there's the informational analytical side of the brain. And yet you're talking people. Those are two completely opposite sides of the brain functioning together. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll take so, your word yeah, for it. yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. So are you naturally more analytically minded because you know the law? Because that's what I think of when I think of law. This is my perception of law mm. is it's about data and details, but you speak mm. the language of people. How do those two worlds work together in your brain? It's a yeah. big, it's a big so, question, so, eh? Yeah, I mean, in my brain, I, I mean, I, I don't really know. I guess it just happen, it just happens, right? Like, I, probably, I would guess that I, like me personally, I'm probably more analytical, or at least I started more analytical, mm. and then um, I've over time sort of not sure whether I just naturally have evolved or whether it's through like intentionally doing it, probably a bit of both. I've like developed that side mm. of, of practicing. And, you know, to be a private practice lawyer, you have to be good at dealing with people. You have like, that's actually, you know, they don't teach you that at law school, but it's probably the most important thing. Um, if you want to go and, um, you know, you want to work for government and you want to um, write policy, you, you know, of course, you're still going to have to interact with people and, and make sure that the policy machine moves and you've, you've been a team and that sort of thing. But in terms of like actually impressing people, having people trust you, developing relationships, if you can't do that um, in private practice, then you, you'll you never be able to, to generate revenue. Mm. You'll never have um, a legitimate business. Mm. Um, so the, the advice, is, advice is helpful. Um, but what you really need is, um, yeah, relationships with people. So interesting. And one of the words that's come up quite a few times already in the chat is, is this concept of trust. Mm. It, it trust is such a, what's it, it, every person has a different perception of what trust means based on maybe their upbringing, their cultural beliefs as an example, and it, obviously it's important in law because if you're going into bat for a client in a transactional court case, there has to be that trust with the client that you've got their best interests at heart. But as part of that trust, trust in yourself is the lawyer that you're here to do what's right and that you know you've got this. Like how much of that does the self-trust come into, into play? And again, I'm asking you big questions yeah, tonight. These are big questions. These are big uh, you questions. Gotta, well, you've got to you've got to back yourself. You've got to right? back yourself, and you know everyone. Everyone, um, you know, there's that advice: fake it till you make it, which is <laughs> which is good advice, but it's it's also it's advice which shouldn't be adopted, um, you know, without some caution. And um, so I think, yeah, you, you got to know how much you can you know, how much you can just sort of back yourself and then also when it's appropriate to 
um, to say, hey, look, you know, there's uncertainty here. I need to go away and, and have a look at this. I mean, I think, I, I mean, it's kind of circular, right? Like if you have trust then uh, with the person, then you don't need to know, you know, the answer or you don't need to be able to get it right immediately. You, you, but you, you know, tr find trust is about being able to find out. Mm. It's, it's more about people being able to rely on you to get it right and that you'll make the call at the appropriate time. Mm. You're not very useful to people if you, um, yeah, if you just sort of um, always shoot from the hip and, it, and it, you know, and you're not getting it right. So, mm. you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a balancing act, I suppose. But certainly, certainly the trust is essential. You need to have it in order to mm. be able to do it, do the job well. And I think that, you know, building it is, is hard and it takes, you know, the, the key element is it takes time and you have to get um, compounding wins on the board with someone. And the more wins you get, the more, the more trust there is. And, and then, you know, with that trust, you can also weather the storm when there are losses. So there's a sort of, it's, it, you know, it's, it's like any relationship. It's just time spent, you know, and, and to an extent, lawyering is about, or, or your start in lawyering is, is having people take a chance on you. Mm. And, you know, and when people take a chance on you, you have to perform for them. That's the key thing, right? Like treat anyone who is, who is, who has trust in you, treat them like gold. And then, um, yeah, you get that snowball effect. I love that. It's, it's no different from the world that I'm in, you know, as a performer, it's exactly the same thing. If a client books me as an MC or a speaker or performer of any kind, I have to deliver because I want them to look as good as possible. I want them to get those those outcomes that they've booked me for. There's a huge amount of trust that happens in the work that I do. And this was, it was the same with TV shopping as well. You know, I wanted viewers to trust me so that if I recommended a product, they knew they could trust my word. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's so interesting that our worlds are very different, but those same qualities are actually very much the same, which are, are I guess, a part of human nature, right? Mm. Is there um and and how would you I mean at your end what do you do to to um or how do you see that sort of trade off between um being knowledgeable you know sh you know projecting um I guess ability um but then also not you know being human not uh, not being possible for you to actually be able to do everything at least not straight away like what's your kind of take on that there's that trade-off there around I guess like risk and and how much you can back yourself to pull something off and even though there might be uncertainty I just back myself on everything <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm what twice your age so I've got right. a few more a runs more on the board yeah, yeah. yeah I think and and probably like you highlighted a great question like you highlighted before and that's what these chats are about I've had a few I've had a lot of wins I've had a few losses my upbringing, because you were talking about your dad before, my dad was a huge influence in the work that I do as well. And my father taught me, look back to learn, look forward to succeed. Mm. And so that's kind of how I operate all the time. I'm constantly in the state of self-reflection and then self-projection. Right. So yeah. it's 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 a dance for me. Uh, but And I know that's not everybody's practice, but that, that seems to work for me so that I'm constantly monitoring my, my progress, I think. so. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting dialect. Thank you for asking the question. No, you're, you're the first person I think I've ever... I've ever interviewed that's actually asked me a question All mid, right. mid, okay. uh, mid chat, which is really is cool. Not, no, it's that's good. It's good. It's, yeah. This is what this is supposed to be about. So my transactional, mm. I always think of that term as a, like the, in sales as an example, because I come from a sales background as well. We have the three F of Fs of sales, find them, if I'm forget him, which is a very transa transactional way of, of approaching a client, but you're talking about the relationship with the client. Yeah. So how do you make transactional a sustainable solution in business? You're going to have to expand on that. So do you, do you for me, sorry. Like I think so transactional you, is kind of one off and you're done. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I guess maybe, um, Maybe, I mean, that is the case. Sometimes it's like that. But um, you can also think about it like when I say transactional, what I'm doing is I'm advising people on a transaction that they're undertaking. I'm not selling them 
Uh, something. Gotcha. I mean, I'm selling them my services to do that, right? Um, but I don't mean the transaction that I'm providing to them. Like I'm not, it's not the sale of my services. Mm. It's they're, they're taking on a transaction and I'm helping them out with it. Mm. Um, and, 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 you know, businesses usually take on lots of transactions. Mm. Um, so that's how we get, I guess that's where the repeat business comes from. That's mm. where you get to develop the relationship. And also if you have, if you are not too specialized and, and you have a few different areas of practice, then, you know, like, I, for example, I might help clients out with, um, you know, a property portfolio that they have, but then I also might be doing their, their, um, personal asset planning work at the same time. So you, you end up sort of, you know, helping them out with some, you know, they're all transactions, but they're, they're a broad variety of transactions, um, in their lives. So, um, that's one of the ways that you can sort of get that repeat mm. business going. And in an, in, in an advisory space, it's quite hard to say, in an advisory space, there's a, is there a lot of, do you find there's a lot of pressure on you to always have that right opinion? I know you were mentioning before it's, you know, about the importance of researching that right opinion. You're providing a lot of advice for people. Mm. How do you deal with, because I don't know how your brain works and how your business works. How do you, how do you deal with that pressure? Or, or do you just Cycling know it's right? To work Cycling. <laughs> you know, the, the, for the pressure, yeah, yeah. for, for, um, you know, stress and stuff like that. But to, to get it, to get it right, um, you need to have, ideally you have a team of people. So, um, you know, it's always good to bounce ideas off yeah. other people. And then ultimately, if you can't make a, a solid call, then um, you're an advisor. So you you really have to tell the client that, right? You have to tell them that there's uncertainty, and um, and you know it's it's not enough to just say, oh, it's uncertain. We don't know. You 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 know you still have to put forward what the you know two different ways of looking at it, or or, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. and um, give the client as much information as you can to assist them to make the call. But ultimately, um, if you're unsure, you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't really make that call for the client. It's, mm. It should be for them it's, to make. It's their, it's their, their decision. decision. Yeah. I mean, you've got to support wow. them. Right. And you've got to, you know, you, this is an interesting space because sometimes, sometimes what you, what you need to do in that, and this is why experience is actually really valuable is sometimes, um, and in fact, often there's uncertainty in business, right? In transactions, there'll be uncertainty. And um, and someone who's really experienced will have sort of a sense of what the right thing to do is, mm. right? And that's not, you know, you don't get taught that in law school or anything mm. like that, but you just sort of have your like your commercial nous and you can you can rely on that commercial nous. But the key thing is you can't misrepresent to the client that that's legal advice. Mm. You need to say, hey, look, this is, you know, this is what I think, or this is what I would do. And so traditionally, some lawyers probably wouldn't do that, mm. right? Um, but I think if you have a good relationship and you have trust with someone, then you probably can and you probably should if you want to be a really good lawyer. That's so good. This this topic of trust keeps coming through in everything that you say. I, I find it so interesting. So what what does trust mean for you? <laughs> it just means that people, people are... Um, um, people are happy to rely on you. They, they can, they can give you something and they can rely on you to do it. And what do you think it takes to build that? It takes time. Yeah. It just takes a lot of time and, um, time and experience dealing with the person and slowly allowing them to give you more and more trust. Right. And not stuffing it up when they give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So finally, big, big question. Mm-hmm. What is your definition of authentic success? Authentic success. So I'm not talking about just business success, but authentic, like the feeling of, yes, I've landed, I'm home, I am successful. Mm. What is that for you? Well, there's, a, there's that immediate kind of, uh, maybe it's not the feeling of success, but there's an immediate kind of endorphin rush that you can sometimes get like I don't know you've probably had like a high after something where you maybe you're walking home or something you have that little moment to yourself um, so that's probably an immediate feeling of success 
but that long that long term kind of sense of success i'm not sure i'll, I'll tell you about it when i when i'm feeling it i <laughs> when guess when you're aware of it but yeah the small yeah. battles yeah I, I feel it but um i don't know i i think that i'm you know one of the risks of being too focused on achieve or having achieved success is that maybe you become a little bit complacent i know you should celebrate your wins and all that but um at the risk of becoming too complacent i can't give you a straight answer on on long-term success I think but I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Mike Malloy, thank you so much for joining me in the studio. That's been insightful and amazing, and I wish you every success for the future. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. <laughs>